was feeling like the things that I did mattered. Cause like, you know, you maybe you send an email at like the state or federal level and then like you aren't seeing victories all the time. Um, and I felt very disillusioned with a lot of the work that I was doing until I started working in the community and on the local level. Because then you send an email to your city council members, you send an email to your mayor, and then when they see you, they said, oh, I saw your name, you sent me an email. Um, you know, it gets brought up when they're making these decisions that's impacting literally everything that you do, your entire community, and your day-to-day -day life. So I think really with creating environmental change, and that's why a lot of our work at Climate Action Campaign focuses on building community will and giving people all the resources they need so they can easily advocate for themselves and understand what options they have to actually ask for change and how they can sort of connect with their local elected officials. I think we need an all hands on deck approach and one of the ways to do that is to enlist organizations uh, that, that might not otherwise put the, the environment at the top of the list of their priorities. Call to mind your favorite nonprofit that is not specifically environmentally focused. You could do there what we have done at Irvine United Congregational Church, which is to remind them about mission, to flood them uh, from time to time with information, to raise the priority among always competing priorities, and to use the organization's resources to pursue climate justice and climate change of, of, the, of the best kind. So you can use the budget, the newsletter, the opportunities, the, the, the forums, the meetings, of your favorite nonprofit organization, mine's a religious organization. Religious organizations have worship on Sunday and choir on Thursday. And what you do is you put the environment in front of them on all of those occasions. And then you get out in the community and you join a coalition like this one. Thanks, everybody. So this next question is for Keith, Ari, Kim, and for Rachel. What does a just and equitable future look like to you? What is the world that you are fighting for and what will it look like in the future? It's about priorities. It's about the generation that follows the generation that follows my grandchildren. The justice is transgenerational over the next 800 years we have to work for a just outcome with that kind of dedication and that kind of long-term outcome in mind. Um, for me, a just future, I mean, it's about clean air and also not burning fossil fuels. So we have all the pollution in the air, all the greenhouse gases that like uh, is is negatively impacting everything but I mean it's especially about I think a long-term vision for for what we want for ourselves and our kids it's it's not about the profits next quarter it's about the next generation and then how how are they thriving are we thriving right now that's what I want to ask on an environmental level social level economic level we want the next generation to not just inherit a world that's with so much wrong in the world, we want them to have a vision of hope for the future. So I think that a clean environment and a sense of hope is a big part of that. So basically, everything you said, I'm like a thousand percent, but really it's just any child, regardless of zip code, can have access to clean air, a safe park. We learned in Philadelphia that children that live in lower income zip codes are exposed to much more dangerous pesticides. Like that's a land we don't want to live in, right? So we need the planet to start protecting the soil. And once we protect the soil, it protects everything else and our ecosystems around it. So we need every child to have access to a park where they can play and not be endangered or exposed to environmental toxins in the air and the soil and what they're utilizing to actually grow the turf. To me, a just and equitable future is one that, one in which um, health disparities are 
more evened out because um, we don't really feel it as much here or um, in in um, our media we we tend to see that like in America we don't feel the effects of climate change as much but when you look at third world countries and um, countries in the global south like um, for example Southeast Asia and the Pacific um, and how studies have shown that they are the most at risk place in the world from the climate crisis because of um, because of the natural disasters that are being exacerbated exacerbated at the highest rates there. Um, it was really personal for me when I heard about that because that's where my family is from. And to hear that those countries are not the ones that are com contributing the most to the climate crisis, but it's the ones in the global north, like here in America, it really shows how uneven this issue is and how um, our issues here in America are affecting other places even worse. Thanks, guys. We're going to have uh, the other panelists answer one more question, and then we're going to take questions from the audience for a couple minutes. So for everyone else, could you please share how you stay hopeful and motivated to do this work? Please start with go first? Thank you. Well, being a psychotherapist, um, this question comes up a lot at work, and there's a lot on eco-anxiety. That's real, and that happens all the time, every day. I know personally for me, it's a matter of under, reading the realities, reading that marginalized people who contribute the least are being impacted the most, and paying attention to what's happening in the world, which keeps me motivated, but then finding action that I can do that makes a difference, and listening to my heart and where my strengths are, and empowering others in their strengths. Uh, and finding that balance. Yeah, I would definitely say that working in the environmental field and also just like seeing everything that goes on, it can be very easy to slip into climate doomism and one way to stay hopeful and rooted in the work that you're doing and not sort of give way to that is for me surrounding myself with community and with people who are also doing the same work. Because um, I think when you're with other people, it's it's a bit easier to be like, no, 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 it's not just me. It's not the weight of the entire world and solving the climate change and everything going on on just one person. I have a lot of other people with me who can also pick up the work on days when I'm not able to, right? Like we have so many people that came before us and many that'll come after us to keep doing this work. And that's why I think it's really important to have coalitional spaces where not only in your organization are you talking to people, but you're talking to people in different organizations doing different sort of work and really just feel affirmed that when we are all coming together, we got it. And another thing I think with that too and being hopeful is reminding yourself of your victories. I know we talked earlier today about uh, the victory with Poseidon, but like that victory that we had this week was so hopeful and something that I keep reminding myself when it's easy to get um, sort of, again, just thinking about everything else to remind myself, no, you know, the community came together, so many different organizations came together, and we have some amazing leaders like Sunrise, who's here, that led, and that's why we are able to have such big victories. Thanks, guys. We're going to open it up for anyone to ask a question, and then we'll wrap it up with one more question for all the panelists. Any questions? You can direct them at anyone you'd like. So uh, for all the panelists here, oh. So for all the panelists here, how do you recommend somebody in the audience get involved with environmental activism right now? Uh, personally, just starting off with this question, I'm inspired by all of these panelists here and how much work they've done, uh, the achievements that they have here. This right now is a great opportunity to join a coalition, join an uh, organization that you're involved with. Uh, but personally, Rachel and I were a part of a school that neglected uh, environmentalism and sustainability until we applied pressure on administration to really take a look at it and change for the better. Uh, so you could start a change. I know that sounds corny, but you could start a change within your own community or your own campus. 
take one or two more ideas. Want me to answer that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, call me on the telephone. Uh, I'd love to inspire some kids to do holistic plant raising and heal the ground from, from the bottom up. Uh, there's so much opportunity study in the There's 230,000 ungrazed acres in Orange County. And the only way we're going to get rid of our wildlife problem is to start putting the large herbivores back on the ground. Wildfire problems. All of those there's, this is the simple solution to solve most of man's problems, but you got to heal the soil. you got to get the bugs to live in the ground 365 years, and then all these days a year, and then all of these environmental problems kind of go away. I just want to um, echo what Lexi said. Find a community. Don't do it by yourself. Find a community that you connect with and find where your skill fits into that. <laughs> very, very quickly, uh, reform and sustain our whole thing is connecting people to ways to get started. So we have uh, a fun quiz on our website called the Environmental Volunteer Sorting Hat. It's like a personality quiz. So you take it, it's kind of like one of those BuzzFeed quizzes, and you answer questions about your personality and it'll link you with an environmental organization that has uh, your interests represented there. So, um, and it really is about finding other people um, because we can do more together than alone. Um, so yeah, again, echoing what a lot of people have already said, you know, there's a lot of way to gain skills. I'm sure you already have a lot of skills. And if you wanna get plugged in and do environmental work, I think another really good place to start is the Orange County Climate Coalition because a lot of these organizations here um, are there. They show up, they're telling you about their meetings as well, giving you announcements, letting you know about local actions we have going on. Um, and it's a good place to go learn skills, meet other organizations, and maybe see where it is that you fit in best to make a lot of impact in your community. And don't overlook the organizations that aren't necessarily specifically about climate change and the environment. Reach out to people who already know your name. Raise the level of awareness about the climate within that organization. Partner up, use their resources, get a budget from them, and then reach out. Do we have any other questions? Also, is Rachel Pointer in the audience? Piner? Piner. Piner. Hi. Hi again. I uh, I just wanted to mention, and all the responses which were excellent. None of you uh, mentioned though connecting with, working for. A local elected official or maybe even more directly have any of you considered running for office locally and taking charge of things yourself or write a check well you can write a check you can do that endlessly but you know it takes some courage for people to actually put themselves out there and actually run for a school board seat a city council seat a water board seat uh, this is important if our local democracy is going to work. Um, people have to not only talk about making it work, but they have to be part of making it work by offering themselves. By offering themselves. Any of you thought about that possibility? Never a better time to announce, right, guys? <laughs> Well, we certainly can find a couple people who might be willing to speak on that. In the meantime, let's have one more question. Um, so what was like the biggest thing for you guys to get started in your own community to like make an impact? Thanks. What's your name? Trevor, great question. Give it up for Trevor. Keith, you want to start with that one? There are essentially two ways that you persuade people. The first is you give them facts. Some people are all about 
consumer reports and trying to decide whether to buy a Toyota or a Ford, give them facts. The second way you persuade people is you make it a matter of social importance. All the cool kids are driving Fords and Consumer Reports likes Fords. All the cool kids are for climate change. And by the way, the intergovernmental panel says, fix it in a hurry. <laughs> Um, yeah, as far as a really good place to get started, um, one is just to come to events like this, meet people, put your name down on the emailing list, and then answer the emails, read the emails. I did that for a long time. I would be on a lot of mailing lists and then just not get involved after that. Um, it is taking that first step, showing up to those first meetings, being there. This, is, this right here is a great first step just take it that one step further and actually plug yourself into the communities and groups who are here right now. Yeah, that's that's really good. So I wanna first thank you for that question. It's a really good question. Um, so for me, when I was in uh, 11th grade, my biology teacher showed me an inconvenient truth. It's a documentary about climate change and basically that opened my eyes to this whole issue. Um, it's important, like, I think teachers like that are so important, like she was a huge mentor to me and really helped me see myself as someone who can make a difference. So that was one, how I got exposed. And then when I, when I really felt like I could go from being a scientist to an activist is when I took this free three-day training, it's called the Climate Reality Leadership Core Training. Linda can mention more. But um, I just wanted to do something more active, like I can't just be a scientist and do my science over here and hope someone will do something about it. I wanted it to turn into action. So um, trainings like that can really jumpstart you. Uh, it, it was the inconvenient truth for me too. Um, and then honestly, the 2016 election, I couldn't sleep. I had to do something. I, um, I curled up in a ball in my bed and I had a good cry. And then I got up the next morning and I said, I'm gonna do something and I went online and I found the Climate Reality Project and they were doing a training in um, March of 2017 and I went to it and then I came back to Orange County, joined three climate groups. I got a lot of good training from Citizens Climate Lobby, then decided I want something more local here and then that's how I got together with Orange County for Climate Action, Roger Gloss, and we launched a Climate Reality. So just try something, find your spot, and educate yourself, watch movies, or in any way you can. Full transparency, that little dude is mine. <laughs> He's actually the reason why I worked on this effort. Um, my dad played for the Yankees, even when we lived in Bermuda. Our boys were playing baseball when everyone else was playing cricket and rugby. So when we moved to California from Bermuda, we thought everything was organic and everything was safe, everybody's surfing, only to find out that they were utilizing Roundup to show the children where to run and a track. So that was the big aha moment for us because Bermuda, which is a not progressive country, had banned Roundup because of the negative health consequences. And to, I, I just felt like as a mom, I failed because this whole time we're trying to keep them healthy, not lose them, like let them thrive, only to learn that every time they went to baseball practice, they were exposed to Roundup and um, 2,4-D most likely because that's the norm of, of management for baseball fields. So I didn't know until there was something enough that meant enough to me to find other people that are upset about this. I didn't know that you could reach out to city council members. Like we reached out to city council members and they agreed to meet with us. Like I didn't even know that was an option. And to, to meet, you know, we were lucky enough to meet with three elected officials back in 2016 and all three offered to bring it forward. So, I mean, this like these are things that are attainable. These are things that if you care enough about an issue, you can fix it. And when we got the city of Irvine to switch to organic and regenerative management, I went to our advisors, most of them are from UCI. Um, I said, well, can the boys play all-stars? And they said, well, do you want the answer or do you want the boys to play baseball? I was like, oh! So it just, I mean, it meant working more. So we worked with 
Tustin, Costa Mesa, San Juan Capistrano. We picked San Juan Capistrano because they were protecting the horses on the equestrian trail from pesticides, but not the playgrounds where the kids were playing. Like that's where we're like, oh, that's a low hanging fruit right there. So I think as long as you are passionate, just like you said, passion is what will anything follow through will get whatever you want done. As long as you agree to follow through, it might take a week. The city of Burbank, we met with city staff on a Thursday and organic policy was approved on a Tuesday. I think that was like the fastest policy ever. Um, that's not normal, but it can happen as long as you're passionate. Uh, I decided on my eighth birthday that I wanted to be a cowboy. And I never changed my mind. Um, I got in the cow business in 1979 and I had a mentor, a mentor named Newt Wright. And he said, if you're gonna do this for your whole life, he says, you gotta think about the fact that when you come out of the place, when you die, you should leave it better than when you got there. And I've been on a continuous search on how to heal the planet since that time. I run into Jim Osmo, Alan Savory, and a whole bunch of other mentors that have led me into an area where I really feel I can make a difference. For me, it was an intersection of several things um, because I got into um, my my major of study anthropology. Um, I learned in the class that um, that certain communities and uh, like certain communities are disparately impacted by a certain health disposition because of the place that they live, and um, that just reminded me of where my family is from the Philippines and how um, they're disproportionately uh, like predisposed to illness and like that illness like cancer um, because of the environment because of dumping in third world countries from first world countries and so um, learning about that in anthropology and then being on social media and seeing some um, youth in my community uh, such as Sunrise Movement and seeing how seeing their formations and see how well organized they are and how uh, they put their whole heart into um, fighting for this cause and not only for their future, but for their families and where they come from. I really wanted to be a part of that. My favorite spot on my campus is a pond that's hidden in the corner of the campus with uh, two turtles, uh, as well as a, a duck named Honk. Uh, and I love that place. I go there every single time I'm stressed with like computer science homework uh, or just any stress in general. Uh, but after the pandemic, it was completely unmaintained uh, with weeds and trash all over the place, hurting Honk the Duck, uh, or Honk the Goose, sorry, uh, and the two turtles. Uh, I, I connected with Rachel Abelos as well as Derek uh, and our professors who are environmental science professors. Uh, and they taught us what to do uh, when it comes to putting pressure uh, on the district as well as putting pressure on the biology department uh, and we were able to like gather a community to do a cleanup uh, although that doesn't make a great impact uh, in a societal way uh, it does create a spark of uh, just the lack of climate humorism and the fact that we can make a difference uh, so we hope to be an ally to all the other initiatives here uh, to make an actual change thanks everybody and give one more round of applause to our irvine climate coalition panel